You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. To Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter M. Lemwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24 7. On December 9, 2021, Denzel Drawn, an organizer with the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement in San Diego, California, was found not guilty on all charges after a highly profiled case of resistance to police terror. Denzel faced eight felonies two counts of pepper spraying a group of San Diego cops, and six counts of preventing an arrest. Denzel faced as many as 11 years in prison and had been originally charged with almost 20 felonies. Denzel had testified that his actions were in defense of the protesters who had been brutalized by the San Diego Police Department, and the jury agreed in their unanimous decision. The San Diego District Attorney's Office clearly thought they had a slam dunk in this case. They never offered Denzel a single plea bargain. With similar cases in the docket against organizers in San Diego and around the United States, the case versus Denzel drawn had important legal implications. At the trial, the only non-legal personnel who showed up attended in support of Denzel, yet almost daily. Teams of attorneys and clerks from the district attorney's office observed the trial and took notes. On August 28, 2020, Denzel attended a demonstration in downtown San Diego organized in direct response to the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The demonstration was also part of the larger uprising in response to the brutal murder of George Floyd by killer cop Derek Chauvin on May 25, 2020. Tens of thousands of protests happened in over 60 countries and practically every state in the U.S. that spring and summer. San Diego was no different. When Denzel arrived at the August 28, 2020 demonstration, he immediately noticed San Diego cops rushing into a crowd of protesters. Protesters were pummeled and beaten by these cops. In the most severe instances, Denzel witnessed an officer run over an African man, hitting him in the head and knocking him to the ground. Denzel also witnessed Officer Jonathan Lucas punching a detainee in the head at least five times as a detainee laid on the ground subdued in police custody. The video evidence in court showed that many protesters moved to protect the defenseless protesters being brutalized by the police on the ground. One of the cops' pepper sprays rolled towards Denzel and he defended the protesters with the pepper spray. The San Diego County Deputy District Attorney Clayton Biddle defended the brutality of the cops. He called multiple witnesses, all police officers. He did not call any of the officers caught brutalizing the protesters. One notable absence was Jonathan Lucas. In June 2020, Lucas shot and killed Leo Ibarra. Lucas subsequently visited and disrespected the memorial site, posting offensive messages on social media. Biddle attempted to slander the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement and dismiss the African right to self-defense and black community control of the police. During the pretrial hearings, Biddle attempted to submit online postings as well as an impeded membership card as evidence in the trial. 
These items are barred as hearsay. He tried again during his cross-examination of Denzel. Biddle failed. The African working class won. The judge stated that he did not want the trial to become a struggle of ideology, but of course, it was always about ideology, a war of ideas. Denzel openly professed his defense of the African working class and his opposition to the tyranny, the state's monopoly of violence. Biddle asked if Denzel hated the police. Denzel stated that he hated the fact that in every community he has ever lived, the cops have the ability to kick in the door and murder Africans with impunity. Remarkably, Denzel even stated he believed in the principles of touch one, touch all, and fist up, fight back. Biddle attempted to demean Denzel's education during the cross-examination, and none of this worked. Biddle's tactics were not of his own creation. They were taken directly from a colonial playbook that had been successful before, and by all given purposes, he and others expected to be successful this time, but they failed. But justice was not served. True justice cannot be had until the colonial domination of African people is overturned and African people have the ability to determine our own destinies, producing life, labor, and value for ourselves. This victory is, however, the result of the revolutionary surge of African people and people in true solidarity with our struggle. The shaky foundation of colonial capitalism has laid bare the brutality of this system and what amounted to an almost all-white jury, no Africans, united with Denzel against the agents of state repression. Today on Black Power Talks, we talk with Denzel Drawn and his partner Paris Davis about their victory in court as well as the way forward. Denzel and Parrish are both organizers with the International People's Democratic Ahur Movement in San Diego, California. They have participated in many programs and campaigns in San Diego, including the Black Power with the Border Working Group that brought material resources and political education to African migrants across the colonial border in Tijuana, Mexico, the Ahur Shule Virtual Freedom School for Children during the COVID shutdown, and the Beta Salaam Academy. They are currently developing the Black Community Control of the Police Working Group in San Diego. Welcome to the show, comrades. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, 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 uhuru y'all. Uh, welcome to the show. Now, Denzel, I raced to the court to try and find out the verdict. I was about 30 miles away, I don't think you knew that, when you called me to say the verdict was in. And I don't even want to tell you how fast I drove in the rain that day to get to the courthouse, running there in my sweats and T-shirt. How did you feel when they came back with the not guilty verdict? Relieved, shocked, surprised. I was overwhelmed with emotion. And I I just uh, knew it was a huge victory for and peed him in the, in just the revolution at a whole for, for an all white jury to give me a not guilty verdict and then to say that they understood and they uh, were they were there for, they were with me from the beginning it was a shocker it was a relief uhuru 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 what about you Parrish uh, how'd you feel when that verdict came down uh, because I know uh, I know that they had you know, barred you from bringing Shadahay into the court, as we'll talk about in this interview. But, you know, you kind of bogarted your way in and uh, you brought Shadahay in no matter what, right? So how did you feel? Uh, that's right. Um, Shadahay was not allowed into the courtroom since the beginning, from the beginning of the case. And um, when we were told that the jury had reached a verdict, um, we had decided that we were just going to take Shadahe in anyways. And um, there was eight charges, I believe. Eight, 21 from the beginning, but by the end it was eight charges. So eight charges. So he's uh, reading, uh, it's eight individual pieces of paper, and he's reading everything on each piece of paper. And, you know, after the first one, there's like a wave of relief. And then you hear the second one, and then you're like, okay, this is, this is, this is sounding good. And then you hear the third and the fourth and the fifth and so on and so forth. And uh, 
during this time, Shadahe is laughing and uh, she's excited. <laughs> and the judge gets to the last paper um, and he shoots me like this death stare, like, <laughs> you know, shut that baby up or get that baby out of here. <laughs> and I, I decided to stay put, but his, his eyes didn't let up on me. Um, so we, we simply left the courtroom, but I, I was smiling on, um, in the hall. I mean, I was rejoicing. I couldn't wait until, you know, Denzel and everyone came out so I could, you know, give my man a hug. I hear that. I hear that comrade. Uh 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh I hear that. Now I missed the verdict, but when I was running up through the courthouse, uh, to get to the floor where the trial was being held, uh, I passed a group of jurors. They gave me a thumbs up and said it was not guilty. It was a trip because I could visibly notice the jurors not being swayed by D.A. Biddle's demeaning comments towards you and African independence. So what was Biddle's reaction when the not guilty verdict came down? Uh, he, he was actually uh, sitting sitting in the... Uh seat with his head down looked like he was biting on the side of his mouth and he uh he, you could tell he had a, a defeat and it was it was beautiful to see <laughs> a state agent feel the defeat by the hands of the people it was it was beautiful Ooh. 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 Denzel so the not guilty verdict reflects the momentum of our struggle and the contradictions in colonial capitalism that have laid bare for many in the colonizer nation, the culture of violence that the society is built on. Yet the aggressiveness and at times the sheer arrogance of the district attorney's office reflects a digging in of the colonial state. As we noted in the opening of the show, the DA's office attempted to put Impedum and the African Revolution on trial. This is part of a larger colonial strategy we notice around the U.S. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis has signed House Bill 1 that redefined protests as riots and mob intimidation with a penalty of up to 15 years in prison. When you were on the stand, how did you experience the DA's attacks on your anti-colonial ideology? Well, he tried to uh, ask me questions like, my strong beliefs, uh, you hate police officers, don't you? Or mm-hmm. And he tried to get me to uh, re- react to that. And uh, he, I guess, expected me to. And of course, they have a profile of me. So, of course. He, I guess, he ex- expected me to try to win them over <laughs> with uh, African ideology. And I knew I, I knew better than to do that. And the uh, public pretender. Uh, told me not to, to just to uh, answer in a short, decisive answers. And that's what I did. But at some point, or that's what I tried to do. <laughs> at some point, I went against that advice. I explained the everyday existence of Africans in this country and what we have to live under this state, under this state of oppression. And I think that really uh, won the jury over, and it, he evaded he evaded any answers to that like, and he tried to uh, walk around them. So who? Oh, 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 yeah, because you know one thing that I noticed while you were on the stand was when you said something about oligarchy, and then he came back with this smugness about, you said, oh, so is that what that means? And clearly he was trying to bait you into something that he felt would sway the jury towards him. But then he came back with you and he's like, yes, that's what it means in the dictionary or something just really, really demeaning, right? You know, really to say like, you know, you know, you dumb black person or something like that. You don't even know what these words mean or something like that. But, but I really, uh, you know, just salute the way in which, uh, you know, you held your own on that stand uh, for what amounted to probably felt about three hours. <laughs> it was probably about, what, five minutes, if that. And it felt about it felt like an hour. It did. Yeah, I was sweating. I was I know I was thinking <laughs> I was sweating. I was I was angry. I was flustered. 
the way he badgered me and he tried to uh, yeah, attack me. He, he gave the dictionary definition of what oligarchy is. And it is almost as if he wanted me to give the names of the people in a way. So almost to get me in trouble. So yeah, I've, I avoided that uh, question and he moved on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Because once again, I really want to salute really the active uh, way through which uh, you played a part in your own defense. I mean, the pages of notes, how many pages of notes did you take down while you were doing this? And I mean, I seen you, there was a time which I was like, man, Denzel needs to just get up and start cross-examining because Denzel, the one making the, the points and stuff like that, you would lean over to your attorney, then your attorney would, would, would make a cross or ask a certain question. How many pages of notes did you take as part of this? I'm counting them right now. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of notes right there. That sounds like a lot of notes because, because this also just lets us know, look, uh, no matter his efforts to really demean you, Colonial schools or whatever schools he's gone through doesn't determine it. Uh, I think you really uh, displayed in this uh, the genius of the African working class. So, so Parrish, as we know that you were prohibited from bringing your young daughter Shedehe uh, into court. I find it funny that they did not want the fact that Denzel is a loving father to sway the jury. But the district attorney was able to present all sorts of lies and distortions. But that's a whole other story. Nevertheless, a lot of community showed up to support you, even watching Shatterhead at times so that you can go in and witness the trial. So uh, tell me, how did you experience the trial? Um, I got to be honest, it was pretty, pretty crappy sitting outside and having to wait till everyone came out to tell me what happened or what was said. But Nonetheless, the community rallying behind me and behind us was definitely helpful. Um, there were times where um, Tasha would either keep eye on Shadehe so I could go in and take a peek yourself, um, helped out Mich- Comrade Michelle. Um, there was so much help um, that I had received just in regards to like picking up our son from school and just the little things, uh, going to go get me a water or a bite to eat. At the end of the day, it really uh, shows you what community is about. And like, it, it's very hard to imagine going through this whole process without the community support. Uhuru. Uhuru. So we hear her in the background. Uh, tell us something about Shadahe. Who is Shadahe? Shadahe um, is our sweet little baby girl who um, kind of seems was born and you know, baked a mist of this chaos. It's funny. <laughs> her, her, her name is uh, Shadahe Njeri. Shadahe meaning celebration in Kiswahili and Njeri meaning uh, daughter of a warrior. Um, so while she was baking inside, you know, I was on the streets. Uh, 12, uh, 12 days, you know, trying to get Denzel out of police custody, trying to get them to lower that bail. Shadahe definitely is a fighter. Um, she's very <laughs> determined, very headstrong. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the environment and everything that was going on at the time in which she was growing on the inside. Uhuru. So Denzel, did you get that page count? Uhuru. I wrote uh, 30 pages of notes. Uh-huh. 30 pages of notes. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, you were definitely on point during that trial, comrade. Uh-huh. So so how did you experience the community support for you? To be honest, it was very last minute yeah. of me knowing when my trial was going to be. So the day of or a few days before, I had to uh, post online and try to get as many people as I could there. I wish I would have knew, known the date months in advance or, or at least a couple of weeks in advance. But with with the uh, such short notice, the community really rallied around it. Uh, a comrade named uh, River, she was at, she came to every day and she was there every day. And she was actually, uh, she, she's one of the comrades out here that organizes with locally here in San Diego. And it, it was, it meant a lot 
to see someone there every day because I've I've had cases and it hurts to not see someone out there uh, supporting you. And you almost think, OK, I'm about to get railroaded. They're basically about to uh, hang me. No. And no one is going. No one's going to uh, say say anything because no one's here to defend me. So it, it meant a lot. And uh, the more the momentum, the more days the trial went on, it went from uh, it was nine days. So the more days it went into, the more people came out and they really showed support and they really rallied behind this being much more than just uh, a trial about me. And, it, and, that, and that's important because that's what it is. And it really meant a lot to... Uh, defeat the police state in at least just one uh, instance, one battle, one trial. And it did a lot for the people of San Diego. After uh, the trial was won, a lot of people said this gave them hope. And before trial, I didn't, I didn't think about if once winning this meaning that much to the people of San Diego, but I understand, uh, How so now? So who? You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are discussing the acquittal of Denzel Drone. Uhuru Denzel, so so can you explain the events of August 28, 2020 for us? One thing the state tried to use against you was their harassment of you while you were driving. Can you tell us how everything played out that day? Well, I was driving, uh, we got to a protest. I was at the police headquarters and I didn't want to park right by the police station because we were, we were going to march and we were going to uh, leave the police station. So I didn't want to leave my car there. So I got in the car and I followed the protesters. And when I did that, uh, the police said they, they blatantly lied and said, I mo, I ran multiple red lights. So, they said in court that they were, it was a uh, traffic violation. And they had a whole bike team who stopped me in claims of a traffic violation. I thought I'd, I would be arrested. I asked them several times. They didn't give me an answer. They just told me to stop. So I said, well, I'm following the protest. And any other protests I have uh, went to, they, many of them had cars had caravans of cars behind them or in front of them, but they didn't allow us at that protest to do that. Claiming something like a Charlottesville or someplace in on the east, back east, where uh, some white supremacists had, uh, crashed into protesters. And they claimed that that could happen in this case, although we were with the protesters. So they uh, tried to, they said they were gonna give me a ticket I called the protesters back and rallied the protesters to get them to not give me a ticket. And I told them to let me park and I demanded that they let me park and they finally did. So it was, I got out the car, parked the car and I ran towards the protesters. And uh, in doing that, there was another woman being stopped for a so-called traffic violation, but they put a uh, police in between her and the protesters. And there were maybe 20 police officers in riot gear and, uh, or in, uh, just, they were suited and booted, I should say. And I arrived on the scene, uh, yelling fist up, fight back out of the megaphone and, and fuck the police, which they, uh, continued, the DA continually said in court to try to, uh, diminish my character. And, the bike team then arrives in between the police officers and the protesters, and they started to hit people with their bikes in the chest and in their body. They picked up their bikes and they would just uh, push people back with them and hit them with their bikes. So, of course, what the protesters did after getting hit with the bikes five to ten times, they reacted and they uh, started to curse uh, the, the uh, police officers out and. One protester uh, gave them the double bird and 
So Officer Jonathan Lucas takes out his spray and he sprays one of the protesters in the face. And then he, the protester backs off and he, he gives him the double bird again. And that's when chaos broke out and Jonathan Lucas went for the protester and he started to hit him. He started to take him to the ground and start punching him. And that's when I turned and I saw that. And that's when everything started to happen. And it, it blew up from there. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. Now, I know that they didn't allow a lot of this to be admitted into court, but it's all public evidence. As you know, one of the cops you saw brutalizing a protester was Jonathan Lucas, even though he wasn't the only one that you saw brutalizing protesters. Lucas had already gained a reputation for his brutality amongst protesters, and two months before, he had killed an indigenous man, Leo Ibarra of whom we had held some protests for uh, before that. So what can you tell us about Lucas and his reputation? Well, his, his Jonathan Lucas's uh, file is no longer public. I don't, I don't know if it was ever, but it's not. His, his file has been sealed. Uh, we attempted to get his file and use it in court, and they said it was sealed. They said they didn't fire him for that instance. They said they, they claimed he resigned or he, he got fired for a, another instance. But of course, he he got fired from multiple things that he he continually did, and of course, the state is going to seal the files. So I mean, it doesn't look bad on the state of how many times he has done so many uh, things, and they repeatedly allowed him to have a job there. So of course, they're going to seal the file. Uh, there was Jonathan Lucas uh, was he's known as the headbuster. So. The sergeant admitted, uh, he was one of the first people on the stands, the sergeant, he admitted he got Jonathan Lucas onto the bike team for, and when he transferred from, which is predominantly uh, well-known as a black and uh, Mexican majority neighborhood, I believe uh, Logan Heights or City Heights, they transferred from, and they transferred, uh, that sergeant transferred to the to the bike team because he, he, he got a higher position, so he became a sergeant. And he came in charge of a team of other police officers. And the first person he wanted to bring along was Jonathan Lucas, the headbuster. <laughs> and the bike team is known to work in the gas lamp district, which there's a lot of homeless people and drunk people and just a lot of people who go out and party. But uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's known as a, uh, a road cop that the hmm. state allowed to stay uh, a cop. For as long as they could until uh, several instances like this came up in his uh, pattern and they finally let, let him go. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, that's uh, uh, disgusting. Paris, all along the way, you led a relentless African internationalist defense of Denzel following his arrest. We'll get into some of that soon. Yet it's important to note that the community support and court watching by Hua movement members was not spontaneous. It was in fact a concerted effort built on more than a year of organization by the Denzel Defense Committee. Comrade Paris, do you want to speak to some of your support for Denzel over the past year plus during this trial? Uh-huh, yes. We had support in uh, in many ways. Um, like you said, it, it, the the time span between the entire um, from when this took place to um, the trial was a little over a year. We had support from our local Impedum branch. Um, we had support from local activists. Um, there is a um, uh, a woman in our community who does. Uh, people who ha- who are currently um, going through cases and need um, some sort of uh, legal advice. Um, she has a call every Sunday to where she lets people get on and like say where they're at in their, in their case. And she gives legal advice, you know, something that we don't typically get from public defenders. Um, we know that they're also agents of the state. And yes, while they're meant or said to help, you know, they don't always have the best advice. Um, We also received um, support 
Um, in the way of resources, I know when this all first happened, um, the, the police were holding people's belongings, which included things such as wallets, cell phones, uh, identification cards. Um, and it's hard to, uh, you know, get a job without having a form of ID and then you have to go down to the DMV and they're asking for certain forms of ID. And when your wallet and stuff is held up, uh, th those things can almost be kind of made impossible. So we received a lot of support. And like I said earlier, it's kind of scary to imagine like what would have happened if we didn't have that support. You know, we always hear stories where people get swept up in case of mistaken identity or people get swept up and alleged to have done a crime and there's no one there, you know, to come to their aid or there's no one there to support them and to, you know, hold their hand during the long, scary journey. Cause it, it, it is scary. Like you don't know, uh, it's the uncertainty of it all and you know, what could happen. And, um, I'm just very thankful for the support that we had and the outcome of the entire situation. Uh -huh. Uhuru, Uhuru. Now, uh, Parrish, uh, that leadership that you displayed, it didn't begin during the trial. At the moment of Denzel's trial, you were pregnant with your daughter Shadahe, as you noted. Nevertheless, your urgency led to the organization of the initial protests on August 29, 2020. Can you explain that moment for us that you were feeling right there? And that urgency that uh, Saturday morning? Uh -huh, yes. So I was made aware. Um, I knew that um, Denzel and some other comrades had went out to the protest. And I knew that something had happened. And Denzel said he was going to step out again. And that he would be back shortly. Well, he, he, never, he never came back. And then I woke up. I had some sort of a dream of premonition that something wasn't right. And I made a few phone calls and, you know, lo and behold, you know, he was in custody with an insane um, bail amount of $750,000. So yeah, um, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I just knew something had to be done. I had received leadership from, uh, you know, our impedum vice president, Matsumela, and he had advised me. We went ahead and gathered um, some forces. Um, that very first night, we had somewhere between 15 to 20 people outside the jail. And we protested, we demanded that, you know, Denzel be let go, that they lower the bell. And from, you know, from day one to day 12, you know, we continued to gain support. And we continued to organize. There was a number of crazy incidents that had take place in front of the jail, from, you know, the officers coming down with their um, batons and shields, uh, trying to scare us away. There was one night we were outside um, protesting. We had moved to the opposite side because they kind of had put a barricade around um, the front of the jail where we were protesting. So we moved to the back side. We had an officer throw a cup of soda off of like one of the high floors onto us. And um, even when they attempted to get us to go away, they had moved in cell to George Bailey. And we didn't let up. We were still outside knowing he was no longer inside that said facility. Um, but we continued to rally and we continued to organize and we made sure our voices were heard. Uhuru. 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 Yeah, yeah. I remember that period. And uh, of course, I was out there for uh, much of the time. I really just think that uh, it really just shows the way through which African internationalist leadership over mass struggles uh, displays itself. You know, in 1977, Chairman O'Malley Eshetela laid out uh, seven different ways to which uh, you build a mass movement and a movement for African uh, liberation. And one has to do with, you know, winning Africans to the position of political independence. The other one has to do with becoming the leadership, right? Exerting leadership uh, and direction over that struggle. So uh, in many ways, this was a mass campaign uh, to free Denzel uh, initially from the jail, but ev uh, eventually 
leading towards these acquittals. And I do uh, just really uh, want to salute uh, your leadership, your role in that entire uh, process, because it was about organization, you know, uh, the how many countless hours of meetings, the political education, the the Sunday rallies, the raising of of resources, the the African internationalist leadership of the variety of community organizations that we organize in support of you and your cause, be it the Bell Fund or many other people with different political tendencies and things like that. I really uh, just um, really want to salute uh, the organization that you all were a part of. Uh, and uh, pushing this struggle forward. Uhuru, I really just want to um, echo uh, what Montemello said. I mean, it's, it's really um, no small thing, and as I can't really express how um, just how significant the struggle is that you all undertook. So yeah, I just want to second that. Uh, Paris and Denzel, and Peter and San Diego formed the Denzel Defense Committee. You all established five demands for them to free Denzel, lower the bail, Drop the charges, reparations to your family, and black community control of the police. Through organization, you all have achieved three of these demands. Denzel, there are a lot of rumors swirling about your treatment when you were in jail for those two weeks. I know it's hard to know everything, but how did you experience the activism outside the jail during those weeks? Police were, of course, uh, the COs were, of course, uh, they, were anger- they were angry at me. They were... Uh, they were verbally, uh, I guess, assaulting me or, or tr- attacking my character. And one uh, police officer, one CO, tried to taunt me to fight him, this Asian guy. Uh, and he had two white guys behind him laughing and uh, cheering him on. And uh, it was actually when they uh, told me to strip. They told me to strip and get naked. And get out of my clothes and and uh, get into uh, the these the jailhouse clothes. He threw them at me. But before he uh, demanded that, they 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 told me to get. Up. We were in a holding cell, and there's a group of us, and they split us up and put us in two groups. There were six of us, and they put us in groups of three. And after they put us in groups of three. They let the other two stay in a cell with each other, a holding cell. And they put me in a, 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 a cell by myself. And then they told me to strip and get naked. And uh, the Asian guy, while I'm changing, he comes up behind me. So I, I, I while I'm bent over, changing my pants. So I, I walk away from him so he's not directly behind me. And then he says, this uh, MFR, this little MFR, he's... He's the one who caused all this, this MFR. Then he says, I, I could take this little MFR or little whatever he called me. And uh, I said to him after that, after he said all this, dude, you clearly just want to be white. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the white guys behind him, they stopped laughing and stopped smiling. And I said, they're never going to accept you. You, you are their little pond. You're nothing. And he stopped talking to me and he didn't even take my clothes, which he was supposed to. He just left the cell. They all left. They shut the door, left me with my own clothes and left me with the jailhouse clothes. And I folded my clothes and waited till they came back. So obviously he didn't like the response. But I take it he was uh, trying to get me to react to him. And uh, later he comes back and he, he basically... Uh, tries to get me to fight him. So I told him when, when I got out of jail, uh, we could go to the dojo. <laughs> but he, he, he didn't respond. And again, he, uh, he left. So they were, they, were, they were trying to get me, I guess, to get more charges so they can trump more charges on me or get me to assault a, 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 a CO. So I guess I can have a history of that and a, and, and a pattern of attacking the police and COs and other agents of the state. So he, they, they failed, though, miserably. Uhuru. 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 Yeah, I mean, just that whole, that whole, um, just that standoff, you know, with this Asian uh, CEO attacking you in that way with two white men behind him. It sounds like a real metaphor for, for neocolonialism. So I just wanted to just, you know, salute you for your, your stance in that instance. And this really just shows the whole, like, 
you know, the psychological assault of, of this whole experience, you know, when Africans um, are locked down and down to him trying to bait you into an attack and just the strip down process and isolating you from others. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a really a, a twisted process, but this is, this is neocolonialism. This is colonialism. So I just really wanted to appreciate your response, comrade. Uhuru, uhuru. And, and, and there, there was a lieutenant in there that came to me that's told me uh, to basically ask if the woman downstairs that's pregnant and the child could leave the protest because they didn't want to hurt any of the protesters. And I just want to s- salute that. I, I knew that in, in that instance, that had to be my wife and it had to be uh, uh, Natal, our oldest son. And, and, I, and I, of course, I told him no. And he said, why not? I said, they're here for a good reason. I'm not telling any of them to go home. And and that was a, a beautiful moment when I, I, I realized that, because uh, a lot of times we think protesting and marching, it doesn't do anything, but I realized this this meant something. And we were we had momentum and was going somewhere. And it was obviously bothering the police for them to come to me in my cell to let me know that all I had to do was make one phone call and tell, that's what they thought. They thought as if I was some type of, <laughs> that I was leading the protest from inside the jail. <laughs> I thought that was, that was, that was pretty, it, it was pretty funny because it, it meant that they didn't know who was the damn leadership and they didn't know who was uh, organizing any, everything. And it was, it was a beautiful moment to know that we were actually fighting in such a way that we were gaining momentum that you could actually see it. So I just want to uhuru, salute all the protesters who were out there every day to uh, get me out all 12 days. Uhuru. <laughs> yeah. yeah uhuru, uhuru. And I remember that. So I'm happy that you went into that because this is exactly what I was trying to get you to talk about. Denzel, much of the coverage around your case and your acquittal has been about the events on August 28, 2020 in downtown San Diego. Yet your acquittal reflects the much larger significance of the global uprising since the murder of George Floyd three months earlier on May 25, 2020. However, in that immediate timeline, there were also other struggles that you were involved in supporting. When you said on the stand that every community you lived in, the police, have the ability to kick in the door and kill Africans with impunity. I immediately thought of Breonna Taylor, who was murdered by cops in your home state of Ohio. So I want to ask you this. What role did that entire period of African resistance play in your own political development? I grew up watching and seeing cops murder us with impunity, so... Uh, one thing the DA got right is I've never liked uh, the police and what they stand for. So that, that has played uh, a huge role in my political development and uh, my revolutionary development and just me as a person uh, realizing that we as African people in this country and abroad have little to no power and uh we, that's something we need to fight for. Ooh. Now, uh, one of the things that you said on the stand, which I'm pretty sure the DA thought was going to get you locked up, was touch one, touch all, and fist up, fight back. What did you mean? And what was your intent? You know, you seemed very intent on making sure that you said that when you were on the stand. So uh, what do you mean by touch one, touch all, and fist up, fight back? They touch one of us, they touch all of us. And that's how we, ha- ha- as a poor and working class people, have to uh, fight when fighting uh, something that's much more technologically stronger and advanced than us as an individual. And that's the only way we can win is when we uh, combine and unite and fight against the beast. Because uh, Trying to be up there and fight that fight my case by myself, even if I even if I had one, it's it's I I, I highly doubt that I I would have even had the strength to want to go to trial because uh, 
the theory in the in the in the the theory of African internationalism and, and just the line that which it has brought to me in my awareness of how things are in the world as an African has true has really developed me in these last uh, three to f- three years or so. So knowing that I was content on whatever happening to me happening to me, whether I be guilty or not guilty, but before being a, a member of Impedum, I may have taken a uh, plea deal, and because of that, because of uh, my awareness and uh, being uh, politicized, where I am in life mentally, I wasn't content on taking a plea deal. I'd rather have been found guilty rather than take a plea deal. And that fearlessness of the of the of of the leadership of the, that fearlessness of being under the leadership of the party really helped me, and it helped me want to fight until the until until the end and to stick it out until I, I heard guilty or not guilty. And thankfully I heard not guilty. And that, uh, that's what I meant by, uh, fist up, fight back to, to fight against the beast. Basically what Malcolm X said when he said by any means necessary. Uh, cause a lot of times at the protests, people, uh, they would say, uh, hands up, don't shoot. And that's a very passive way to fight against a beast. You can't win fighting against a beast in that manner. You can only win against fighting someone who has a moral compass. When you're fighting something that doesn't have a moral compass, they don't give, a, they don't give, uh, they don't care if your hands are up. They're still going to shoot. They want your hands to be up because that means you're defenseless. But when you have your fist up and you're fighting back, you're fighting for power, even if that means you're fighting in the, sh- in the streets, dead and uh, sprayed by the police. You fought an honorable fight because uh, I would rather fight standing up fighting. I would rather die standing up fighting than, die- than dying up on my knees. And that's what I meant by fist up fight back. Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah. Um... You know, and that's that's a revolutionary sentiment uh, going all the way back. Makes me think of the poem by the great poet Claude McKay: uh, "If we die, let it not be like hogs." And at the, he ends the poem by saying, "We'll face the cowardly pack. Uh, stand up, standing up. Uh, we're right back against the wall and uh, 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 fighting back." So, a um, on that. Now, Parrish and Denzel. On December 12th, the Hur movement threw a victory party for you all. How was that experience? Uhuru, I enjoyed the victory party. It was it was great. Um, the piece that you read, Matsumela, was great. As usual, you always give a, uh, a good detailed history and analysis of where, where we've come from and then where we are at currently. So I enjoyed it. Uhuru. Uhuru. It was very uh, humbling, and uh, it was good to know that fighting for Black power is it means something in San Diego. Because sometimes, with there being so so very little Black people here, seeing how the community came out and they supported, it meant something. It meant that they they're watching. They they know what's going on, and they're listening, and they're. Uh, they're on our they're they're in the fight with us. And that that means something to me at least. Uhuru. Uhuru, uhuru. And one last question. You know, one thing that I noticed around this whole thing is it was a call for organization immediately after you got released, even while you got released. You know, the community, the Uhuru movement activists were out there calling people to organization. Um, so you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah. I, we couldn't have done this. I don't think we could have done this without uh, revolutionary organizations such as Impedum and uh, the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. As Africans, uh, joining an, uh, African, the African Revolution and revolutionary organizations such as uh, Impedum, uh, ABDEP, African People's Socialist Party, 
and just uh, fighting for black power and fighting for reparations. Uh, we're fighting to charge America and every other colonialist uh, power uh, with genocide against African people. And uh, we're demanding that we have power in our community of the police, black community control of the police. And we get to choose uh, who police our neighborhoods, if anyone, and uh, how they should be reprimanded or if they should be fired or if they even should uh, be able to have a job in our community. And we deserve that right and we deserve that power. And we need Africans to uh, join us in that fight because we can't do it without the people and power lies within the people. And we need the people to realize that and help us in this struggle to fight for power. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru. And congratulations again on this historic anti-colonial victory. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we discuss the acquittal of Denzel Drawn with our guests, Denzel Drawn and Paris Davis of the International People's Democratic Ahur Movement in San Diego, California. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Elika and Goma. Thanks to the Black Power Talks production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and Ahipsa Panda. You can pray until you faint. If you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of-